What did Jesus say to the apostles? He promised to send them the, the Holy Spirit. And he told them that when this happened, when they received the Spirit, they would also receive power. He promised them power. And this promise stretches all the way back to the prophet Joel. If you have your Bible with you tonight, I encourage you to open it with me to the book of Joel. Tonight I'm continuing to preach through uh, this book. And Joel 2 contains a prophecy about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What Joel said and uh, what Jesus said as well, record for us in Acts 1, uh, both of these things were fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. For your consideration tonight, I have divided the second half of, of Joel. You can see there on the screen, we're going to look at verses 18 through uh, 32, Joel 2, verses 18 through 32. And for your consideration, I've divided this passage into the following Sections number one, the pitying Lord, the produce restored, and the prophet of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit empowering the apostles to, to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, to be emissaries of Christ, was no fluke. The gradual end of biblical Judaism and the beginning of the Christian age was predicted hundreds of years in advance. Joel predicted the Spirit would be poured out upon all flesh. And tonight it's my goal to show you from the Bible that this prophecy that Joel made, it has been fulfilled. And this is one piece of evidence which shows you that the New Testament is trustworthy. That the, uh, that the prophets predicted the coming of the Christian age, the coming of the New Testament period. It shows you that God... Uh, planned in advance the age of the church. And so let's begin with that, that first point, the uh, pitying Lord. And we're going to uh, look at Joel 2, verses 18 and 19. Joel 2, verses 18 and 19, it says, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. So here we learn that the Lord is, is jealous and he shows uh, pity. Now I think, um, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but in my opinion, when we hear the word jealousy today, it usually carries with it a negative connotation. Uh, a negative meaning. But we should understand, especially as Bible believers, we should understand that jealousy is not always a bad quality. Jealousy is not always a bad quality. You know, consider what the Bible says about God in Exodus 34, verse 14. Thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. You know, it's interesting, have you ever seen like a study of the biblical names of God? This is one of them. Notice, uh, jealous is capitalized. You know, one of the biblical names of God is jealous. And so we should understand that having uh, jealousy is not always a bad quality. According to the thesaurus, uh, desirous and possessive are synonyms of the word jealous desirous and possessive. And so God, who is holy and perfect, uh, He has a, a desire, uh, He has a, a possessiveness when it comes to His people. All right, And He has these qualities in a righteous way. In this sense, He is jealous. You know, just for the sake of illustration, you know, let's um, uh, imagine you have a dog or whatever you know, kind of animal you like. You have a pet. You have a dog that you love very much, and you're out at the dog park, and you happen to see a stranger trying to steal your dog. Would you just sit back and do nothing and say, oh, hey, that's fine? Well, not if you really care about your dog, right? You know, you'd, you'd go confront that person and say, hey, what's going on? What are you doing with my dog, right? Uh, why? Well, because you have jealousy. 
you have jealousy, you, you have a desire, you have uh, um, uh, possessiveness for, again, this animal that belongs to you, that you care for. And that's kind of, you know, a simplistic illustration, but I just hope that gets the point across. You know, in a similar way, God is jealous for his people. Uh, he does not desire any harm to come to us. He does not desire uh, for us to invest ourselves in religions and philosophies which are, which are false, which are not according to his will. He wants the best for us because he loves us and he, uh, he cares for us. And so again, in this way, he, he is jealous for us. He's jealous for his people. Uh, mentioned alongside the Lord's jealousy in, in these two verses we've just read is pity. Again, pity is another word today that sometimes can have some um, negative connotation with it. But again, here it's used in a positive sense. Uh, we would probably uh, be more comfortable with the word compassion today, that God is compassionate. Again, in this sense, he is uh, one who shows pity. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us, like as a father, and notice again, as a father uh, pities his children. So the Lord pities them that fear him. Psalm 103, verses, verses 12 and 13. So again, he pities us like a father pities his children. He has compassion for us, as a father has compassion for his children. And so because of the Lord's jealousy and pity, he would once again provide the, the people, in the, in the context of, of Joel, God's people, he'd provide them with corn, wine, and oil, the necessities of life. Continuing with verse 20, Joel 2, verse 20, it says, But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. So here God promises to remove, the King James says, the northern army from God's people, referring to the locust plague that is described uh, in great detail in this, this book. Here this locust plague is referred to as an army the northern army. The book of Joel has some parallels to the ten plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians, and I think most people are more familiar with those. You know, the famous, or maybe I should say the infamous, ten plagues that came upon the um, Egyptians. And I see here a, a parallel. Uh, in verse 20, again, speaking about this northern army that God's going to drive far away from his people. Um, in verse 20, it says, His stink shall come up, his ill savor or smell shall, shall come up. And the same thing happened regarding the plagues. It happened with the Nile River and the fish when they started to rot and stink. Um, it happened with the frogs. Uh, if you remember, the Egyptians were plagued with frogs, and it talks about how they were everywhere. They were in their house. You know, the place where they made their food and bread is covered with frogs. And well, when that plague ended, all those frogs died. And we read this in Exodus 8, verses 13 and 14. The Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, uh, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. Right? The land stank. That must have been a nasty smell. Right? Piles of rotting frogs everywhere. Uh, there's a point, there's a reason I wanted to bring this up, not just to be gross, but I think there's something interesting here. Uh, the translation, this word stank, comes from the Hebrew word ba'ash. Uh, ba'ash. And this word is also used to describe sin. Right? This, this word is used to describe someone who, who willfully and flagrantly disobeys the word of God. And so here we're actually given a vivid picture of, of sin. You know, what does God think about sin? It's like a pile of rotting frogs. It's like a, a, a heap of rotting locusts. Who, and as they begin to rot, that stink rises up in the air. That's how God views um, sin. In Proverbs uh, 13, verses 5 and 6, here the Bible says, A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. 
Righteousness keepeth him that is upright in his way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. And you can see there up on the screen, I've highlighted that word, loathsome. This is that same Hebrew word, ba'ash, again, meaning to stink, right? Uh, again, this is, this is the same word that talks about the rotting frogs and these, these rotting uh, locusts. So again, a very vivid picture uh, of sin and uh, shows us that something we should never make excuses for. It's something we should uh, always endeavor to avoid. God promised to remove this northern army uh, and it would be destroyed. And with the removal of the locust plague, the land would be able to rest. Uh, the land would be able to recover. Uh, the harm that was caused by the locusts would be undone. And so this brings us to our second point, the, the produce restored. Let's continue reading in Joel. Joel 2, picking up with verse 21. Joel 2, uh, picking up with verse 21, it says, Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And notice verse 25, it says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat and plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God. He hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. So in the, the first chapter of Joel, uh, Joel predicted uh, the loss of, of produce, uh, the loss of, of basically all vegetation that also affect the, the livestock and the, the cattle that they, uh, they had at the time. And, you know, this book is a, a reminder, I don't think it's something we, maybe we need to be reminded, I guess, but, you know, the physical is important. And uh, there are some physical blessings associated with, uh, with God's Word. Go back to verse 26. Uh, verse 26. Uh, here, it's promised, it says, you shall eat plenty and be satisfied. Again, this is, this is God's inspired word to uh, His people going through a difficult time when there was a shortage of food. He says to them, you shall eat plenty and be satisfied. And then what is the result of that? Of them having the food they need and having satisfaction? Continuing in verse 26, it says, and praise the name of the Lord your God. Right? And it, and it continues. You know, if a person is literally starving to death, then of course that's not the best condition to be in to, to pray and study the Bible and think about spiritual things. You just, you just want food. That's, that your mind's not going to be focused on, uh, on God. And so this is the, the proper attitude towards food, clothing, and other physical blessings. When we get what we need, when we are satisfied, that ought to motivate us to, to praise God and bless God. His name. The ideal is to balance mind, body, and soul. And I know that's kind of easier said than done, but that should be one of our goals in life. That should be the ideal to find balance in our, in our spiritual walk, uh, regarding our uh, physicality, because we are physical beings to some extent, and also our, our mind and our way of thinking. And this same idea is taught in the New Testament. Um, this verse in Acts is uh, quite similar to what we've just looked at in, in Joel. Acts 14, 17, it says, Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, and that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So here it speaks about God's work in creation and the natural order of things, the seasons God has put in place. And the Bible says that's all good. 
right? So when we think about the physical world, uh, material things in the world, of course, all that can be taken too far and it can become sinful, but just the world as it is is good. The physical things that God has given us is, is good. Um, and 3 John, 3 John is just one chapter. In verse 2 it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. And so we can and we uh, should ask God for physical blessings, uh, praying in a way which is according to His will. Um, again, especially praying for again, the necessities and the things that we need to live and survive and do well. Um, in this world. And so God promises the ancient Israelites here that He would provide for them. Again, verse, uh, verse 25, that He's going to restore the years that were uh, taken by this, this plague. Now, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, and chapter 2, verse 25 correlate to one another. So let's go back. Let's go to Joel 1, verse 4. Joel 1, verse 4. And again, I'm reading from the King James, and the words for the, um, the bugs, the insects here might differ if you're using it, uh, probably will differ if you're reading from a, a different translation, so just, to, just take note of that. Um, but Joel 1 verse 4, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath, has the caterpillar, uh, caterpillar eaten. And then as you continue in that ch chapter 1, he just talks about the devastation, just how severe this plague was, that everything was just um, consumed by this, this swarm of, of locusts. And then again, going back to chapter 2, verse 25, chapter 2, verse 25, he says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and so on. So we read about the destruction in chapter 1, but then there's also the promise of restoration, the promise of renewal in uh, chapter 2. And I'm not going to read it for, for time's sake, but if anyone likes to, to take notes, um, you can write down chapter 1, verses 5 through 12, and that corresponds to what we've just read in chapter 2, chapter 2, verses 18 through 26. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 12, and chapter 2, verses 18 through uh, 26. Um, chapter 1 describes, again, the devastation, just the destruction of this, this plague and how their, their food, their, lively stock, their, their livestock, everything would be um, affected. And in chapter 2 describes the restoration of, of it all. And so Joel predicted the arrival and the removal of this severe locust plague, that they would survive uh, this plague. Um, however, there's more to this book uh, than this. Uh, he predicted something more, something which would come after the Lord restored the years that the locust had, had taken. And so this brings us to our final point this evening, the prophet of Pentecost. The prophet of Pentecost. And again, if there's anyone here who likes to take notes, um, I suggest the following. I would um, in some way highlight or uh, write down Joel 2, verses 28 through 32. Joel 2, verses 28 through 32. And then um, next to that, I would write fulfilled in Acts 2, verses 16 through 21 fulfilled in Acts 2, verses 16 through 21, and we'll, we'll get to that and read that in, uh, in just a little bit. So in Joel 2, again, we have the promise of, of the, again, the produce being restored, their crops, their food being restored, and we pick up with verse 28, Acts 2, 28, or sorry, not Acts, uh, Joel 2, 28, we'll get to Acts in a moment, Joel 2, 28, and I notice in the first verse it says, it shall come to pass afterward. And that's, that's an important word to mark down. It'll come to pass afterward. Right? After what? After what we've just read. You know, verse 25, back into verse 25, after God had restored everything, this, this swarm of locusts 
uh, destroyed. Verse 26, after they w- were able to eat plenty and uh, be doing well for themselves. So after all that, uh, verses 28 and following, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my uh, spirit upon all, I'll pour out of my spirit uh, upon all flesh. You know, the book of Joel starts simply. You know, it's, it's very, I think, a very simple book in chapter 1 and 2. Um, in summary, you know, chapter 1 and, and chapter 2 describe the devastation of a coming plague and then the restoration after that plague was over. However, that's where the simplicity of this book ends. And uh, Lord willing, as, we, as I preach, continue to preach this in future lessons, we'll see there's some very interesting things he, he says from this point onward. Um, from chapter 2, verse 28 and onward, things change. Uh, the book explodes with profound and complex prophecy. All right, And if you are familiar with Acts 2, then this passage we're about to read uh, will sound very familiar to you. So again, Joel 2, Joel 2, 28, It shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. And I'll show wonders in heaven and in earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. All right. Between the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament, there was a period of 400 silent years, uh, a period of time where, where there was no um, inspiration. There are, uh, this is part of the value of, of the, uh, the Apocrypha and the Deuterocanonical books. Um, there is some history they talk about in this period. It's, it's an interesting time to study. Um, you know, Alexander the Great, if you've heard of him, um, uh, it was during this intertestamental period, that during this period of 400 years between the Testaments, that's when he basically conquered um, the Mediterranean world, and he's the one who brought the, the Greek language to the Mediterranean world. Lots of interesting things happened, but as far as the Bible goes, there is no scriptures given in this, uh, in this, this period. And again, many people will refer to this as the intertestamental period, just meaning the period between the testaments. And uh, I just want to mention this because, you know, Joel is a difficult book to date. Uh, however, we can say with confidence, at the very least, he wrote 400 years before the events of the New Testament. Because, again, everything in the Old Testament, at the very least, is 400 years before the time of, of Christ and the events of the New Testament. And uh, we should always keep that in mind when we're reading prophecy, whether we're reading from Isaiah or reading Joel or Malachi or whatever it is. We're, we're reading things that uh, were written down hundreds of years before the time of Christ and the time of the apostles. So again, Joel predicts the outpouring of God's Spirit. And uh, we will turn to um, Acts 2, but before we go there, um, turn back a few books in your Bible to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, and let's go to chapter 31. Jeremiah 31. And before we read about the uh, fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, let's consider what Jeremiah says here. The prophet Jeremiah um, also predicted the age of Christianity. Uh, He predicted the arrival of a new covenant. And uh, in my opinion, Jeremiah here is is clearer, uh, somewhat clearer than uh, Joel and Joel's prophecy that we just read. So Jeremiah 31, let's start with verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, 
that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So, again, pretty clear, right? He says, I'm going to make a new covenant. This is the Lord saying this. This is Jehovah God saying this. I'll make a new covenant. Uh, verse 32, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So again, very clear here from, from Jeremiah. Uh, and that first verse, I guess kind of an easy one to remember, 31, 31, right? In that first verse, he promises a new covenant's going to come. And uh, what exactly does that mean? What, what kind of covenant? How is this going to relate to the covenant that already existed? You know, the, the covenant God gave through Moses to the people of Israel? Well, he says again ex expressly in verse 32, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. You know, talking about the time he took them out of Egypt. Right? This is talking about the covenant he made at Mount Sinai with the people of Israel, the law of Moses. So we're, we're promised here that there's going to be a new covenant coming, one that's not the law of Moses. And uh, again, if you like to take notes and you like a specific passage, we read about the fulfillment of this, uh, again, ex expressly in Hebrews 8 and 9. Uh, the Hebrews writer talks about this, and he actually quotes Jeremiah um, 31, 31. Hebrews 8 and 9. So here we have, again, prophecies about something special happening, a new covenant coming. Again, in Joel's case, the Spirit being uh, poured out. Now, with all that in mind, let's go to uh, the book of Acts now. And we're actually, uh, actually going to start in Acts chapter 1. If you'd like to turn there. And follow along. Acts chapter 1. Now, in Acts 1, uh, Jesus repeated the promise that he made to the apostles several times. Uh, he told the eleven they would receive the Holy Spirit, and when they did, the Spirit would enable them to remember and teach everything Jesus shared with them. Uh, he commanded them to wait in Jerusalem until they receive this promise. Acts 1, verses 4 and 5. Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. And notice what it says here. And this is Christ speaking to the apostles. He says to them, But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Right? So he tells them, Wait in Jerusalem. You are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So that's what they did, right? They waited in Jerusalem. And we come to Acts 2. There's a lot of interesting things that happen in Acts 1. But we come to Acts 2. Uh, they're waiting in Jerusalem, Acts 2, verses 1 and following. And this is going to be a, a little bit of a lengthier read. I'd like to, to really read some more of the, the context here in Acts 2. Uh, we read about this promise being fulfilled, this, this outpouring of the Spirit, this baptism of the Spirit that the apostles received. Acts 2, starting with verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come... They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they are all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, 
Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Now again, what we've just read here in Acts 2 this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Again, Joel prophesied that God's Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. And again, this is a fulfillment of Jesus' promise, made in Acts 1, made in several other passages as well. But we looked at Acts 1. This is a fulfillment of Jesus' promise uh, to the apostles. And uh, let me quickly make a point of clarification just to be a little bit more precise, I know we got some really good you know, Bible students here. Uh, to be a, a bit more precise, this is actually a partial fulfillment of Joel's prophecy because it, it would be completely accomplished when the Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles as well. And you can read about that in Acts 10 and 11 when Cornelius and his household Gentiles, non-Jews, received the, the Holy Spirit. So I just want to note a few things. Uh, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail here. Um, Lord willing, in um, a future class, you know, we're studying the topic of the Holy Spirit on Sunday mornings. Uh, we will look at Acts 2, and I'll go into more detail. And if there's any questions or anything, we can discuss that in our, in our Sunday morning Bible class. But let me just point out a few things here. Uh, this reception of the Spirit, and again, this is, again, if you go back to Acts 1 and what Jesus says, this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the apostles, and the idea is that they were completely enveloped in the Spirit. They're completely filled with the Spirit. This was not some private thing. Uh, they weren't, you know, having a little prayer, and, you know, the Spirit was whispering in their ear, and no one else knew about it. This was very loud. It was very... Uh, public, it got people's attention. There's this you know, miraculous sign of, of fiery tongues uh, above their heads. So this was no private matter. This was very loud. This was very um, obvious. And we should keep that in mind because basically uh, similar things happen in Acts 10 and 11 where we also read about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Very obvious, very, uh, very uh, public. Um, notice in verse 4, Acts 2, verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And it says, They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The biblical practice of speaking in tongues was a miracle. It was a miracle. This was not something that was taught. All right? This was a miracle. This was not speaking nonsense or uh, gibberish. And by the way, there, are, there is an ancient practice of doing that. And the idea of just speaking gibberish that no one understands, that kind of speaking in tongues is not Christian. Uh, it is not biblical. In fact, it is pagan and de demonic. And I'm not exaggerating. If, if you'd like to study more of this on your own, um, you can go to... Uh, Bible encyclopedia, you can just go to standard, you know, like Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, do a search for the phrase ecstatic utterances, or it's also called uh, glossolalia. I know that's a mouthful, Gl glossolalia. Um, this is the practice of just speaking, you know, getting so up in your emotions, you just speak a bunch of gibberish that no one understands. Uh, this comes from paganism. Uh, it's associated with paganism, shamanism, Hinduism, and other false religions. Uh, in fact, if you want to look up, um, you know, look up, uh, you know, yoga or uh, Hinduism speaking in tongues, and you will see 
Hindus speaking in tongues, and there's no difference between what they're doing and what so, some so-called Christians do today and all the, the uh, gibberish that they're shouting that no one understands. Again, this is pagan. It's demonic. This, this practice of just shouting gibberish, this is not Christian at all. It is not, not biblical at all. What we read about here in Acts 2, this was a miracle. All right. According to this passage, what is meant when it says they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and going back to verse 4, filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What exactly does this mean? And if we just carefully you know, go back, and I'll point out a few verses we've just read. Uh, verse 6, and again, I'm reading the King James. Some translations might differ a little. But in verse 6, it says, uh, when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, or they're confused. Why? It says, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So what does it mean the apostles were speaking in tongues? All right, they're speaking in languages. They were speaking in languages. Uh, verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9. And the multitude asks here the question, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? And then you have that huge list of all the different places they were from, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and so on. So they're speaking human languages, you know, earthly languages that people speak. These weren't angelic languages that no one can understand or anything like that. The, they're speaking known languages. Parthians, Medes, and so on, they could understand what the apostles were saying. Um, and then, again, what, what was the point of them speaking these languages? Verse, uh, verse 11, it says, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They understood what the apostles were saying. All right, the apostles were speaking to them in their own language, their own native tongue, and they were, you know, preaching to them, sharing God's word with them. They were, um, again, verse, um, verse 11, they were speaking the wonderful works of God. So again, this was a miracle. The apostles spoke in a language they were not fluent in. Um, it mentions Romans in this list, right? Uh, verse, verse 10, among this list of all these people who'd gathered here, uh, mentions strangers of Rome. All right. Romans, you know, by and large, spoke Latin. You know, that was their, that was their native tongue. They spoke um, Latin. You know, Latin still exists today in, in Spanish and French and Italian and, and many languages that are spoke today. Um, they're Latin-based. Um, again, Latin was the language uh, of Rome. So, if, again, these, these strangers from Rome, if they're fluent in Latin, the apostles were speaking to them in Latin. And they understood that they were the, the apostles were describing the wonderful works of God. So again, they weren't babbling. They weren't just shouting things that no one understood. They were speaking in the people's native tongues, native language, the wonderful works of God. And this is the, the biblical concept of speaking in tongues. And you know, this, is, uh, this is important. This isn't the only miracle the apostles did, but this is the first, first thing they did according to Acts 2. They were able to... Um, heal people, cast out demons, and do other things as you read the rest of the, the book of Acts. But it's important we understand that because this is going to lead up to um, what Peter says in the rest of this, this um, context that we're going to look at. So notice in verse 13, you know, some, some mocked. You know, maybe the apostles were not speaking, and the, these people who are mocking and making fun, maybe the apostles were not speaking in their tongue. And to them, because, you know, if you ever, I don't know, I don't know if you know Spanish or not, but if you were, you know, switch on like Telemundo, you know, you can't make sense of it. And it just sounds, I don't know, it doesn't sound like anything to you. So maybe those who are mocking um, weren't in on the conversation. Um, that's one explanation of why they're mocking. So some mocked, they said, hey, they're, they're full of new wine, they're full of, of sweet wine. Uh, and then notice Peter's response. Chapter 2, verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. 
And verse 16 is really what we're focusing on tonight, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then with verse 17, we have a quotation from what we just read at the end of Joel chapter 2. All right, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel or through the prophet Joel. Verse 17, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I'll pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I'll show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so he quotes that whole passage there, and then he continues in his sermon. And then we have you know, Peter's sermon and the rest of this where Peter begins to speak about Jesus Christ. And so the outpouring of the Spirit, this, this great noise that everyone heard in the fiery tongues, again, these are, these are signs, right? Them speaking in tongues, the miraculous ability to speak in foreign languages. This was all predicted by Joel. And this is, again, partial fulfillment of that. Because, again, the Spirit being poured out on all flesh, meaning Jew and Gentile, that's fully accomplished in Acts, Acts, 10, and, uh, Acts 10 and 11. But, again, notice you know, Peter's words. This is that. You know, we have to let the Bible be its, its own, own commentary. So Peter says, this is that. You know, pointing the outpouring of Spirit upon himself and the other apostles. This is what Joel was talking about. Christianity is not a perversion of the Old Testament. Christianity is not some kind of, of plan B. Uh, Christianity is not a, a movement started by uh, men separate and apart from God. What did Peter say? This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. The gradual end of biblical Judaism and the beginning of the Christian age came about by the will of God. Jesus ushered in the new covenant. And after he you know, freely gave himself the life he lived, the perfect sinless life he lived, when he, when he died for us going to the cross, was buried and resurrected, and doing that he ushered in the, the New Testament. After Christ ascended to the Father, the Holy Spirit empowered the apostles to proclaim this new covenant and to, to further explain this new era in which we now live in. They preach the wonderful works of God. Let us have confidence in the New Testament knowing that the uh, arrival of the New Testament was predicted hundreds of years in advance. Let us have confidence in the New Testament knowing that Jesus' sacrificial death, His burial and resurrection were a fulfillment of prophecy. And let us have confidence in the New Testament, knowing the apostles received God's Spirit, and they were faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ. And again, for all these reasons and many more, we should always put our faith in Christ and uh, have an have a emphasis on the new covenant, which has superseded the, the old. And so if there's anyone tonight who is not yet a disciple of, of Jesus Christ, uh, since we're in Acts 2, you know, we encourage you to do exactly what Peter said to the people, right? The, Peter asked, or the people asked Peter, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he preaches to them even more. And the text says, you know, Those who gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added um, uh, many people uh, that day to, to the church. And so if you'd like to do that this evening, if you believe in Christ, if you believe in the gospel and like to be baptized into his body, um, we can aid you in doing that. We do have a baptistry here. Uh, if we could offer prayers or encouragement for anyone, then please let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.